Hello, welcome to Elijah Weed's showroom. I'm Carolina Weeds here with Will Hutnick. Bravissimo! Uh, it's his largest solo exhibition with the largest canvases to date. We're really proud to have him here today um, and to have this show uh, open from September 10th to October 16th. Today we get to be in a conversation and, and here we'll talk a little bit more about these canvases and queering the landscape. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Will. Yeah. Thank you both. Uh, you know, Liz and Carolina for the opportunity and for the show. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm excited to answer any questions that people might have. Um, we're we're part of this uh, work at the moment, which was the last one that was complete for the show. Um, uh, both this one and there's another painting in the show were my largest paintings to date. These are six by twelve feet. Um, and it was a really nice challenge, especially considering that this space at Elijah Mead Newburgh um, has they've never really shown painting before or traditional painting shows. So I really wanted to make some larger works that could work well with the space and kind of interact with the space. Um, one thing I shall mention before I kind of maybe dive deeper into this painting was that I, I came to the space um, a handful of months before, uh, I've got, I don't remember now, timeline-wise, eight months ago, maybe last year, because a lot of the work was raw canvas as the first layer kind of starts with some various rubbings and kind of found, fancy found footage. Um, <laughs> so I was at the space, uh, you know, last year or eight months ago or whoever long to um, bring to raw canvas and make some rubbings from the brick walls. Um, actually in this space, kind of down below, as well as take some plants from the immediate surroundings. So some of the plants that are here are more definitely from, um, yeah, from the space. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's not really information that has to be known, but I think it adds a little extra element that there is something more site-specific or site-responsive um, to the works that they were kind of, the first layer was, was here. Um, and yeah, um, I, I feel like in the last few years, the work is becoming a little more based around the landscape and trying to like figure out more of double downing on creating a little more landscape and that might, I don't know, probably has that due to a few things. Maybe one thing is to try to be a little more grounded or maybe a little more present, especially um, in these insane times that we are in. Um, one of the ways in which I think I'm trying to accomplish that is both through this large horizontal format as well as the right as, as well as some, <laughs> get over here, <laughs> um, as well as some direct kind of heart horizon lines within the work. So I feel like the work is always kind of tiptoed around topography, map making, moonscapes um, for a long time. And so um, in the last few years, or particularly last year or so, I really wanted to kind of double down on interventions in the and the landscape. Um, yeah, so, so with the horizon line, with this large format, with hor uh, horizontal work, which I haven't done in a very long time. Um, I was only doing vertical work for, you know, the last five to eight years, so these are new. Um, as well as plants are a pretty recent addition within the work. Um, I was kind of always using some various forms of stencils and printmaking moves within the work, right? <laughs> But the plants are kind of a recent thing where I'm actually taking um, one single leaf or one plant and rolling into the work. <laughs> what do you think? Well, will you? Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit uh, also about um, understanding, you know, these large canvases in this space. They just talk a little about the site specific, uh, the site specific um, ideas you had with the rubbings and the, and the foliage. But I also am curious, uh, many people ask about the crates that they're propped up upon. Mm. Uh, what led you to present the work in such a way? Yeah, good question. Um, I think it happened once uh, a few years ago for, uh, I went to the School of Pratt, the Pratt's alumni show. I displayed a large painting on milk crates because I felt, think they didn't want to exhibit the work on the wall. And I think that was a logistical um, Feature and for here, knowing that a the space is 
pretty funky and pretty unique and a lot of grip that we did not want to drill into it. But B, also that um, all the shows I've seen here have been pretty kind of immersive installations or sculpt large sculpture. Um, I guess the C as well is like, I hate all the edges of the works. And I think because, um, <laughs> because I think the work has become a little more object in the last two years by addressing all of the edges that it felt, um, it made sense to also treat their installation as more object by mm -hmm. having them propped on objects and in the round. So, you know, you're, it's still an image, right? We're still this like picture plane, it's still 2D for the most part, but I think by, by having them propped up, by addressing the edges, it kind of um, uh, uh, highlights the objectness of the paintings. Okay. <laughs> Right. Will, will you talk a little bit about the different materials that you use inside of the work? Well, let's, let's look down Oh, yeah, maybe to a bit. different painting. Yeah. Does anyone have this in real life? Please. Chime in. I have a few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you want to go? Yeah. yeah, let's go to this one. And what's the title? This one's called Golden Hour. That one's called Maybe the Moon Shifted Its Positions. Um, because I, I, at some point, it seemed like. I was like, oh, is there this um, moonscape slash, like, it became very sea. There was, like, oh, like mm -hmm. some hot tides and waves. And so thinking about how, I don't know, much the moon or slash other uh, uncontrollable forces are actually changing our environment and climate. And yeah, you can feel the undulation in the, um, almost like the waves in the foreground. Oh, yeah. Somebody else mentioned that, that uh, when they were looking at that piece, that it's like, you can feel something drifting away from you. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think there's something, I think that's very, um, that's a nice segue, because it's feeling, like I always think about like, everything relates back to time, and I feel like the slippage of time, and trying to control time, and <laughs> time travel machines, um, and so I think that's also why there is, um, there is different, there's mixed media within the work, um, there's some very like fast and slow moves, Kind of abutted once against one another, and um, that yeah, and kind of hopefully conflating different times and different moments together within a single work. And you know, I think the repetition for me is a tool that also utilizes capturing a time or capturing different moments of time. Um, and also, there are so many different spaces inside of your pieces that like there's not only little vignettes of other locations, but like the way you put up your materials like really pulls people in to different elements of it and yeah. piece together. Mm -hmm. um, maybe talk a little bit about that. There's even like double horizon lines and like whole vantage points of you going into other worlds inside of a single piece. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, no, I, I like that read. Uh, it, um, I did a lot of collage in the past as well as have a background in um, screen printing um, from Prax. So I think, I think both of those also um, talk to having these like worlds within worlds and this viewpoint within viewpoint. Um, I also read like a lot of fiction and I feel like a lot of novels I mostly gravitate towards are the ones that it's like Easter egg, this rushing nesting doll of worlds within worlds within worlds and you kind of then lose track of what the re, if there is a reality or what that stable what forces, and it, then it actually doesn't matter what came first or what was the step one, but if you're so far down the thing, you know, mm -hmm. relatively so, um, or reality is so subjective mm -hmm. in general, let alone once you build these worlds. Um, I mean, Caldino, I think a lot of, I read a lot of Caldino, Invisible Cities, ugh, right, the best. I gotta get back into, um, uh, I'm blanking on, um, Whatever. Bearing the Trees was the last Calvino, which was incredible, but um, yeah, Invisible Cities was pretty pretty pivotal too. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I think that's actually informed where I can, especially with these larger works, right? I can go into a single area and there's kind of almost like a painting with a painting and a viewpoint within a viewpoint. And it exists obviously within the larger playing field. But I like the idea too that some moments are just very specifically one side of this. It was, this whole page was like ripped apart. Mm -hmm. And um, it also makes me think of, you know, I feel like I lived, in, I lived in Brooklyn for like 
seven years, trying to be in Hudson Valley now full time for seven plus years. And I would become so fascinated with all the posters on the subway or the subway platforms, especially numerous posters that get ripped and you just, the edges of them, so you see like little snippets of information over and over and over again. So that's kind of lodged in the back of my mind where you actually don't need to see the whole thing. You can just see like one fraction of that piece of information or one that element. And maybe even you can think that it's like the entire work was this, but you actually only are privy to one piece. One, piece of that one of the things I really appreciate too is that you're talking about creating these vignettes and stories within the painting as a whole. Process-wise, you see a lot of um, your hand opposed to masking techniques, which I really value because you're, you are masking in a way. You're preventing you know, certain areas from, um, you know, you're pushing back, you're coming forward, you're marking on top of the, the raw canvas where the wax, uh, you know, the crayons are, and then the, the print and then the paint on top, you know, these layers. I guess I just wanted to say, I, 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 I understand how your hand is so eloquent mm -hmm. in a lot of these works where the, you know, it, it, and it's not as precise as say that masking tape would be to pull up. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's something really. Um, I think that's. I'm, I'm glad you say that. I feel like that's all what I get from a lot of people who maybe have seen the work online um, or in virtual space, and then they're in person. Usually, number one comment. That's just like, thank God, is that feels like the work more in person. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, because I think that that lofty line. I think everything is about like the hand. That like, um, you know, I'm not measuring things out. Really, occasionally I will. Um, but, but usually, like, like even for instance, it's like when this grading happens and I kind of knew I wanted to relatively get to a light or very light gray, I mean, I would kind of measure slightly and then I just like use my hand to be like, okay, well, yeah. So everything's kind of an ish measurement. I don't want things to be perfect. And I think that wonky hand really makes it as well where, um, yeah, things aren't perfect. You think they're straight lines and everything is slowly just like shaking. There's like a static and there's a vibrancy and a frequency to even things that you think are stable and like sound logic. Um, so I really like that there's like moments that almost are, are kind of mess up where um, a lot of times if I do a repetitive pattern like this, I'll just like forget one color, mm -hmm. you know, while I move because and it, sometimes that's how this pattern happens because you just forget one color and it just like slowly shifts. A lot of times it's purposeful, but a lot of times it's just out of my, or maybe not out of my control because I'm doing it, but like, you know, if you do something pretty repetitive for a while, right, it becomes, um, you're a little less conscious of those moves. Um, yeah, I, so I, I'm not, I'm not taping, I'm not measuring things out. Even things that look like they would be are just very slow to move around other elements. Um, but yeah, and I think, I think that's really important while, while the hand is always pretty evident, both in, um, actually pretty much every, every move, right? It's, they're pretty gestural, pretty figurative in that, that approach. Let's move over to, um, the present is a curtain work over in the space. Yeah, they're all, it's all just like paint and, um, uh, we'll just stop in this one for a minute because there's a, there's, this one has a lot of mixed media. Is that there, uh, yeah, it's mostly acrylic. This whole section, there's some sand mixed in with the paint. So it's a pretty grittier and a larger texture. I use a lot of ink, wax crayons, colored pencil. Um, this is all colored pencil here. Um, and some spray paint too. Oh wait, uh, yeah, that's probably it for the most part. There's like some, some recent ones that also have watercolor and marker. Um, kind of usually whatever I can get my hands into. And usually what's ever in like a reach. Um, 
And when you start out with a piece, do you have a specific plan or you go, you move through it intuitively? Like compositionally, they work, they end up working so well. It's almost as if you're viewing them from a point outside of gravity mm -hmm. um, and you really can go into them. And then that's one of the things that I think people have really enjoyed about wanting to see the work is they can see it from afar and then they get near it and there's so much more. So there's much information. So much information and so yeah. many, so many disorienting things that are making you move in different ways. Yeah, I, I hope that that happens both, well, that micro macro of, of um, that dual perspective, um, as well as if you look at something and you're like, am I experiencing this head on or down below or is this below me, you know? So I think mul multiple vantage points can happen within a single work and that's what I really like to play with. Um, hopefully they're not crazy confusing, but they're like disorienting enough where you think there's like a logic or there's there's something pretty sound and I think the more time you spend within them and it um, that logic kind of like unravels mm -hmm. and you're both above, below, behind, through, kind of etc. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the mixed media too kind of helps with that because like maybe logically you, you're like, oh, I know this is on top because there it's a, uh, because, Whatever, because you can rec you can see something on top, but like this, this, these areas, like this raw canvas with once in the layer, is always the first thing I do, and that's what ultimately I think becomes like the positive shape. And so you almost have to trick your brain into, um, into like what's what's first, what's second, so forth. Right, going like further back, like you know, hopefully this shape and other raw can moments pop out, right, become pretty positive. But the whole case, the whole surface was this at some point. So this is like the step one. This is the first thing, and I usually work uh, up until those moments become both positive, but then can become positive, negative, and go back and forth. But so that's usually when things kind of resolve is when is when that layer in particular has that dual role and that dual, dual purpose. Are there any questions? Ask no pressure. Otis, so there any questions? <laughs> I kind of always have a list of um, a notebook and of uh, phrases that I find, either music lyrics or passages from, from books or just like little phrases that, <clears throat> that pop up. So um, I usually title things way after the fact. It's kind of sometimes a, a, a title pops its way into the language. But for the most part, it's usually after the fact. This one's called The President's a Curtain. Um, so I'm kind of blanking on <laughs> the source material. I'm getting better about tracking. I used to be pretty good about tracking the name and like being like, oh, it's from this novel on this page and, and so forth. Um, Press Play Record actually is from the latest David Mitchell novel that I was reading at the time. David Mitchell's another one, these world building novelists. Um, so that's. No, they had a reference. Um, this one I'm kind of laying on the way more philosophical base of what we're experiencing, you know, as reality and current affairs. Um, it, you know, everything is uh, not just like flawed or skewed, but right where there's everything is like a mediated space and a mediated engagement, both in real life and in virtual space. So, um, Will, when and how did you start? Yeah, after I stretch it, um, it started a few years ago when I, I think when I was at Yado at Residency in Saratoga in 2015, where I was working, actually where one of them is from, there's a pink one down below, where um, I, was working, I was starting with raw canvas and then slowly I paint, and then I think when I stretched it, right, it's like so much information went around the sides that then it just felt like necessary to treat the sides as the same, as, as the same consideration as you would as the front, and so it's like one the same. Um, so after that information, like just physically went over, and you're like, okay, well I can't ignore the sides from the top to the bottom. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun playing with the sides as well, especially if, if the information does not just like repeat. Um, 
because you can almost in words, right? You're like, oh, my mind, your, your brain can be tricked into thinking that there's this space is infinite and goes on forever and extends, but by having a, a new piece of information or a new object on the side, right? You're like, oh, well now this is not just like a negative space that goes back because there's been something completely new over here. Therefore, now this shape has a different role. And so I like that. And, and you, can, you, you can't experience right, all the, the work in one straightforward image, right? You have to like, you have to go on either side of it. If you want to go above and below, there is more information, but I don't expect most people to do that. Um, but there is, yeah, new information. But it, it's side. more than most people do with, with the painting, because mm -hmm. most, mostly people will do that with a sculpture, but with the painting, you don't find yourself looking at the sides as much. So it's nice that you. Yeah. You built that for us. And it affirms the placement on crates, right? By yeah. creating the painting as an object. One thing I want to um, kind of close with as we, as, as we wrap, uh, addressing the curatorial statement in relationship to queer spaces and queering the landscape. Uh, could, you t could you talk to that idea a little, please? Sure. Um, yeah, it kind of flashed my brain a few years ago reading some text that was um, Cruising Utopia. Um, we're talking about um, queerness as a concept that's not being in the present, that it's not this like um, fixed entity, that it would never be actually fixed, so it's always this shape shifter, both, you know, kind of in the present and the past. Um, and I think I'd always like used to describe the work as, right, like, every, there's a lot of motion, some of it's fast, some of it's slow, but everything is like slowly undulating and vibrating and moving. And so when I kind of read this text around it, a queer space that's not fixed and always evolving, it has to evolve because of uh, the world and you know people's opinions and perspectives and so forth, that it just made sense to think about um, the work through a uh, queer lens. Um, and I think thinking more about like the landscape and how I'm occupying space and being out in the world and like, I think also being when we first moved to like just down to New York, my husband and I, like we, you, know, you, you, you can feel spaces maybe where like um, it might not be the safest or there's like something that's a little like charged or like, we, we always joke that if we were in Airbnb in um, some place like two years ago and as soon as we got in the car, we were like, ooh, we're like, this place is really homophobic. We don't know why, it was just like in the air and you know, there's like a visceral experience knowing that something's like either a little off or not safe or whatever, and you're like, how, how do you how do you feel that in the real world? And then how does like um, yeah, so I'm kind of sometimes channeling that as well as then like thinking about like a natural landscape, who are spaces for, and who's occupying space, and um, yeah, I'm still like figuring out trying to think about that a little more because that's like a fraction of what's happening within the work, as well as thinking about like expectations, right? Of what happens within a work and, you know, that maybe the expectations of what's going on are not um, met or in line with what you perceived they should be. That makes sense, or so forth. That was not <laughs> Thank you. Well, so Thank you. Interesting that you, that you mentioned about the Queering of spaces and queering of time because I was reading uh, or writing about that and we were and thinking how, right, like we have ideas like artists or, or galleries, curators around what does it mean to have a site specific work, right? And often we think like, well, maybe like installation that is using uh, an element of the space or a painting that references something that's seen. And when you were talking about the leaves, sort of like that's not information that you need or maybe it is or isn't relevant, I think it's like clearing up the idea of what it means to be site-specific work, right? Even if it was like, well, there's one blade of grass that I use right over there and nothing else. And it's um, maybe unintentional or happenstance that that's what's happening, but it just feels like uh, a new layer to what we think about, right? In, in context of what is site-specific work and how that is even now, 
But like, yeah, like, like this one was like so challenging because there's like so much happening, right? I just kept being like, and it needs one more thing, and one more, and one more, and one more. Versus like, I'm like, oh, it doesn't need all that because I can just let more spaces take over in the character. But you know, this is bigger than that whole painting, probably, right? And so it's fun to have the shapes expand. So who knows? I mean, I, I want to continue to work with large. Uh, I don't know where, <laughs> where they're gonna go, but um, yeah, I think the large scale is, is, is exciting. Thank you so much, Will, for sharing your insight and your paintings and your professionalism and all that good stuff.